Hey guys, Blake Lovell, Southeastern 14, presented by our friends at Bearded Iris Brewing, back here with some thoughts on some transfers in SEC basketball. Yes, I know some of you guys reached out on Twitter asking where some of the transfer videos were. Look, we, we took a couple of days break uh, from basketball. Obviously, the SEC, no teams playing beyond the Sweet 16 in the NCAA tournament. Um, so uh, we kind of geared up, putting all our notes together for transfers and all that stuff. And uh, so we are back. Ready to look at more basketball stuff here, as we'll do throughout the offseason here on the channel. But let's talk about some transfers. Full disclosure, I'm not going to go into every single transfer that has taken place thus far um, when it comes to the, the players that have left or entered. But we're going to sort of go over, I think, some of the more notable ones as of late. And again, you guys know as fast as the transfer portal moves, um, <laughs> there's been a lot of them. And, and so we're just going to jump into a few here that have been a little more recent uh, and we'll kind of touch on um, some of the guys that have left as well. But uh, we will probably start doing these more individual, um, you know, videos in terms of looking at players individually rather than grouping them all into one. But we're going to do that now just to sort of, um, you know, play catch up on everything going on the portal. And as always, by the time you watch this, there will probably be other guys that have entered. So uh, we'll have videos on those uh, coming as well. All right, let's start at Missouri. I know some Missouri fans were asking uh, for some thoughts on uh, John Tanjay from Colorado State, uh, who transfers in 6'5 wing, uh, averaged 14.6 points per game last season, 4.7 rebounds, played 31 minutes a game. Uh, I think he's played at least 20 minutes per game the past three seasons. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> I think he's all on Twitter, probably a lot of people saying this is sort of fits the Dennis Gates model of how they want to play. And when you look at it, I think he nearly doubled his three point output last season. Um, I think he went 61 of 157 from three, 38.9%, which, as you guys know, as we always say in the SEC, you'll take that because there's not a lot of just outstanding shooters in the SEC right now. And, um, you know, but Missouri was one of the teams that proved it could consistently sort of make some three point shots. So I think that adds to, you know, what they want to do there. And, and look, you look at Missouri, right? As we say, the transfer portal always moving. Mohamed Diara, um, you know, has entered the portal. But when you go beyond that for, for Missouri, they have to replace some scoring. And, you know, Demoy Hodge is one of those guys they're going to have to replace. DeAndre Golston gave him scoring perhaps more. We don't know. Obviously, Kobe Brown has a decision to make. Um, so I think you, anytime you go out and, and grab scoring, uh, that can be something that can really help. And I do feel like, you know, Tanjay is a guy um, who just the, the minutes, getting quality minutes over the past three seasons – playing 31 minutes a game last season for a Colorado State team that, you know, has a pretty good, um, I think when you look at the coaching, right, in terms of how they work their offense and those things with with Nico Medved, um, I feel like that's a that's a really nice sort of um, parallel go, going from playing for a team like that to now playing, you know, at Missouri where they probably will do some things offensively, you know, maybe somewhat similar uh, and in being able to kind of add him to the mix. So, I think it's a good fit. Um, I think it makes sense for both parties. Uh, definitely, I think it makes sense for, for Tanjay to be able to sort of come back into a a place where the, the offensive style seems to fit what his skill set is. And again, as I always say, if you're an SEC team out there, anytime you can add someone that can knock down three-point shots, um, I think you will take that because this is a league, as we talked about this season, that finished last um, nationally in terms of three-point percentage in conference play. So, I do think that's a, a very important part of what he can probably bring to the table and just, you know, a guy you can play on the perimeter and do a couple of different things with. So I really like the fit. And um, yeah, it seems like a nice pickup for Missouri. All right, to Alabama we go. Um, Jaquan Walton, who was someone who started his career at Georgia, um, you know, seemed like I can't remember exactly his recruiting. I, I probably should have looked it up, but. I know, you know, he was someone that he felt like was in the mix for several SEC schools coming out of high school. Um, six, seven guy, you know, forward type who, who can play, I think, you know, in a variety of ways. And I think it's going to be interesting on Alabama specifically when you look at some of the things he can do uh, in terms of his skill set, uh, because it does feel like, you know, this is a guy that like we said started in the SEC, um, you know, six, seven type player who can play on the wing, do some different things. Um, Average, I think, about 14 points a game last season at Wichita State, 5.3 rebounds per game, made 42 threes. So, obviously, that's intriguing, too. You shot about 40% from three 
last year. Um, you know, didn't take a it wasn't a high volume of attempts, but he he capitalized on the ones that that he did take. And and again, that can be important in the SEC. So you know, sort of this, not the same with Missouri, but it is somewhat similar, I think, with Alabama in that, you know, you you can look at it here and say, you know, there's some scoring that's that's leaving, right? You know that Brandon Miller, um, you know, Noah Clowney, Namari Burnett has transferred. Um, you know, th- those are just some of the guys we mentioned and know that there is going to be some of that scoring load that has to be replaced. Obviously, Miller is the biggest one there. But when you bring in a guy who averaged double figures last year, um, you know, that is, that's a significant boost because, you know, for Alabama, we know that was one of the things where you just pretty much expect their offense just to keep clicking and it will be different without Brandon Miller, but we know there's going to be a lot of talent still on that roster next season. Um, you know, depending on who all decides to return. And as we said, there, there are you know, going to be guys that exit, but that's just the way it works uh, in this day and age, whether it's guys transferring or going to the NBA. So I think with Jaquan Walton, um, you know, again, someone who th- I think fits the SEC profile, uh, knowing that, you know, there was a lot of SEC interest, I think, coming out of high school and um, ultimately starting at Georgia, found a fit with Wichita State, now comes back to the SEC and, you know, can kind of slot in there for Alabama. And, you know, something, too, I-, I think it's just always important. And what have we seen in terms of like the, you know, the final four now is we see the value of having guys who who have played, um, you know, significant minutes. And so I think for him, you know, being able to play significant minutes, and I need to look at exactly how many he played last season. But again, um, you're talking about somebody who I think just in terms of the skill set, we always say in the transfer portal, it's just a matter of fit. And, you know, I I do feel like he's someone that certainly fits how Alabama wants to play. Yeah, average 32.3 minutes per game last season. Um, Shot the ball as well, 54% from the field. Um, so I think that's something else that you kind of look at and feel pretty encouraged by. And so uh, the fit seems to make sense there uh, for Jaquan Walton heading to Alabama, um, who, will, again, I think just sort of sort of reload here uh, when you look at what the Tide will be able to do next season. Although, as always, the, the roster will be a little bit different uh, when you don't have a guy like Brandon Miller. So um, we'll see what happens there with the Tide and what moves they continue to make. On the roster, um, just a lawn Cooper heading to South Carolina, a uh, guard from Minnesota. Now we know Minnesota, sort of like South Carolina, um, had its issues last season, to say the least. Uh, Minnesota, I think, went nine and 22, only won nine games. Yeah. Um, of course, South Carolina, we, we, you know, well documented here on the channel, had their ups and downs, but did feel like it was a team that got better towards the end of the season. Uh, and, you know, now you bring in someone like this who really was a pretty versatile player for Minnesota. Average 9.8 points per game, 6.3 rebounds per game, 4.4 assists per game. Um, I think he only shot 39.5% from the floor, so that will obviously be something I think that he'll want to improve on. Um, but, you know, I think, yet again, it's it's the exits, right? Gigi Jackson is off to the NBA. I mean, he's likely going to be a lottery pick. Uh, I think, you know, Chico Carter is has transferred, so that's someone else that – you know, played minutes in the backcourt. And so, you know, you have to replace that. So you bring Cooper in um, and I feel like, you know, that's a, it's at least a nice starting point because as I've I've said, I mean, I think Lamont Paris, all things considered, did a pretty good job. I think overall last season, just getting them, we said going, they had the lowest ceiling, I think going into the season of any SEC team. And so for them to improve the way they did, um, you know, it was not anything that was going to ultimately, you know, put them in a position to to be in any postseason play or anything like that. But I still feel like they they made some positive strides towards the end of the season. And, and again, you have to put that in the context of where they were. Maybe not positive for for other programs uh, to have that kind of season, but in the context of where they started, I do think they improved. And so I'm very curious to see how Lamont Paris goes about kind of rebuilding this roster, knowing you don't have a Gigi Jackson there now. Um, and you know, they're going to really have to, I think, work the, the transfer portal pretty hard to, to be able to kind of build, I think the type of roster you need to, to really start to rise up the the ladder in the SEC in the near future. And I don't know if that's going to be next season. Um, but I do think Cooper's a nice, a, a nice starting point just in terms of having a guy who is, has played a lot of minutes in college. He started at Moorhead state. Um, I mean, really all the way back to 2020. I mean, he he's averaged a lot of minutes and, you know, you know, we, we talk about this on the channel um, again, 
the experience, the value of having that many minutes in college. I mean, I don't know how many games last season that Cooper basically played 40 minutes. Um, and so I think, you know, when you look at it from that standpoint, I'm going to look up his exact numbers because I'm, I'm pretty fascinated by that. Uh, but I think you just, you're talking about a guy who has played a lot and yeah. So average 36.6 minutes per game last season. That's something I probably should have mentioned at the start, but when you do notice, you go through his kind of game logs, he played a lot of games where he played basically 40 minutes and he was on the floor the entire time. So someone that is used to playing those high minutes and really you go all the way back, like I said, to the 2019, 20 season, he averaged 23.2 minutes per game at Moorhead state then. So, Every year in college, he's averaged at least 23.2 minutes per game. Um, and, you know, pretty much three straight seasons now, he's averaged 30 minutes or more per game. So he's got a lot of, you know, sort of experience, I think, playing um, and, you know, just getting that power conference experience at Minnesota, even though it was on a bad team. Uh, I think that will help them, you know, will help him kind of adjusting now to uh, South Carolina. And he is a, a native of South Carolina, too. That is, um, you know, kind of that connection there uh, for Roebuck, South Carolina. So, um, that is him making his way back to his uh, home state. So uh, Cooper joins South Carolina. And, and look, those are kind of the three big ones. Uh, I think, again, most recent ones, uh, because there have been a lot of um, sort of players, again, coming and going. But those are the three that have stood out recently. As I mentioned, if you're watching this basically beyond Thursday morning, <laughs> just know that there are probably other transfers uh, out there that we will get to in the next video. And then that may be on Friday or whenever. Uh, but we will have to we'll start having more regular videos coming out, looking at these individually. They'll be a little bit shorter. Um, just kind of diving into each player move uh, here as we go throughout the off season. But before we wrap up, um, you know, some of the players leaving, I know people want to know, uh, tweeted me my thoughts on some of the players that have left severe Wheeler, Kentucky's one. Um, you know, I, I'm not shocked by that. I think it, you know, it just kind of probably makes sense. Um, for him to, to see what's out there, see what other options there are. Um, so not stunned by that one. Uh, Chance Westry, Johan Andre or at Auburn. Um, I know those were two maybe that surprised Auburn a little bit, but as I always say, I mean, it's just, this is the transfer portal. This is what you expect there. Are, I will never, I said this to someone yesterday, I, I will never be shocked. Even if it's the best player on the best team in the country and they decide to transfer, I'll never just be truly shocked by it because that's the nature of, of where things are transfer wise. Now people, may find better options. Yeah, you can't discount the fact of NIL and how that can play in. There may be more financial opportunities elsewhere. Like there are just things like that that come into play. And I'm not just, by the way, saying this about, you know, these two Auburn players. I'm saying this about everyone. Like this is just, you know, kind of that common theme that there's always going to be more opportunity out there. So um, we mentioned Namari Burnett, Alabama. Um, you know, that was one that I think, you know, may have surprised some Alabama fans. Uh, a little bit, but, um, you know, he, he had the injury work back into it, but I, I, you know, that may be one that surprised me a little bit just because I, I thought that he was a, a good fit, but we'll see where he winds up. Um, I haven't have an idea, but we'll, we'll see what happens there in terms of uh, where Namari Burnett heads moving forward. You know, Vanderbilt's lost several uh, players and I know people have talked about Jordan Wright and I've had a lot of questions about Jordan Wright in terms of, um, you know, does he wind up at another SEC school? Well, I don't know. Um, we'll see, but I think he would, Obviously be a good fit because Jordan Wright is one of those players. Again, experience. He's, he's an older guy. Um, that is what we see. It, again, has helped some of these teams get to deep in the NCAA tournament. Um, so he's an older guy, played a lot of minutes. So wouldn't be shocked if Jordan Wright winds up in the SEC somewhere. Again, that's just me, pure speculation. Like, sure, there would be SEC teams that would love to have Jordan Wright, I'm sure. Um, you know, Trey Thomas, Miles Studi, we talked about before, Noah Shelby, uh, Malik Dia, those guys as well. Um, exiting uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, Robert Allen and Ole Miss was one um, that, um, you know, is also exiting. And I know kind of a significant return. I think it was Jamin Brakefield who put uh, on Twitter, I want to say that was on Wednesday. Uh, this kind of all runs together at this point, guys. Um, yeah, so he put on Wednesday that he was returning to Ole Miss, which is significant because we talked about Brakefield this season. Um, you know, I think that he, yeah, he put something on Twitter, basically a picture of him and and Chris Beard and a kind of graphic, but, um, you know, just putting that, that he was excited to return. So um, that's a significant, I think, return for Ole Miss because, again, we did talk about Breakfield quite a bit this season. We may have put him on our all underrated team. I don't remember if we wound up putting him there or not, but um, but that is that, that's a huge boost, I think, for Beard right off the bat because Breakfield's a good player. It's just, you know, we know Ole Miss was kind of had their ups and downs this past season. So, um, again, guys, I know there are more. 
uh, out there. There may have been some I didn't mention. It was not <laughs> intentional. It was just, there's a lot. And uh, we will continue to have you covered here at Southeastern 14. Um, again, we will start doing these more as they happen. But this was us just sort of taking a tiny little break after the, the grind of basketball season and knowing that it is year-round now with transfers and all that. So uh, we will continue to cover all these these roster moves in the transfer portal. And we'll talk about them in kind of some shorter uh, individual videos probably moving forward as these happen. Or maybe it probably is going to have to be a daily roundup at this point because there's going to be so many we know over the next uh, month or so that um, that's just where it is. So we'll have you covered. We'll also be doing some of these state of the programs coming up. We kind of teased towards the end of the season. Um, I'll kind of be looking at, hey, where is this program right now? And, and obviously, when we talk about roster movement, we may not be able to get too specific on who's there, who's not there. but we will just kind of look at the the foundation of where the program is at the moment. Um, you know, some of their recent history, where they're headed, um, you know, the coaching situation, all those things, just to kind of dive into it, to sort of set the stage for this off season. So I'll start to have some of those coming up here very soon. Um, so be sure to hit that subscribe button if you want some, some more insight and deep thoughts on uh, just kind of where all 14 programs are at right now. So we will do that here at the channel. And of course, just be sure to hit that subscribe button for all our other content we have. Uh, football, baseball, it's all there. So uh, hit subscribe, hit the like button. That helps as well. Anything else you guys want basketball-wise? Um, you know, I, I kind of lead the charge here from a basketball standpoint. If there's anything else you want us to do in the offseason, any ideas you have, I'd love to see this. I'd love to see that. Just hit me up on Twitter, guys. It's right there. Um, you know, hit me up on Twitter. Let me know, you know, what you'd love to see this offseason. And, and we will we will certainly entertain the idea and think about doing it because we do have a lot of fun things in the works this offseason. So we want to give you guys what you want uh, in terms of uh, here on the channel. And so, uh, yeah, let me know. Anything you want to see basketball-wise in the offseason, we'll make it happen. Um, we'll have some guests coming soon. And so a lot of fun stuff in the works. So appreciate you guys as always. Um, and, again, we'll have more coming soon here at Southeastern 14.